Thank you for listening to True Crime 49. Season 3, Women Hunted, traces the progression of Robert Hansen, an Alaskan serial killer known as the Butcher Baker. Listener discretion is advised. Beth was a girl that loved life. In a house full of older brothers, she held her own, and it's not easy for a young girl. Little circus trainer living amongst the bull monkeys. There was an impasse one time. When they were young, it happened in a blur and a yelp, and they were already separating her sliding back. A tuft of hair out of place. Steadiness was in her eyes. Panic or fear having become calligraphy. The fire coals dying in the brother's eyes, the bull monkey with an almost invisible cat scratch on his nose. It sparkles when the light catches it. And they saw her backed in the corner before them, a brave little warrior girl. With her young kid eyes, she could see the glimmer over the world and truth seeing it for what it isn't. Born into this new world, surprised at all of the old people. Walking past them on the street, their animation, paper, flicking so slowly, while her spills in a rushing cascade, pouring like waters in a flash of days. When she became a woman, there were patches of this world that had lost that glimmer, and it looked for her like it looks for us. But the old silver screen was there behind her eyes, and giant swaths still left there. And when she set her mind to something, it's as if she might have been cast in stone. Celia Beth Van Zanten was one of four siblings who shared a home in Anchorage. She had recently graduated high school and was attending Anchorage Community College. She spent the day with her mom and her aunt shopping and couldn't wait for Christmas a few days away. Crunching out under the snow, it was bitter cold, a world of dim gray. Her brothers were watching a broadcast on the protest of the Vietnam. Smoke rising in the air, the room glowing from the cast of the television box. So she is stepping out to go down to the Bilo store to get some soda. Over the sleepy rooftops, the plumbing vents steam into crisp black air. The temperature is still dropping. Now at zero, it lingers, part over the cold edge, before it falls deeper. Nearing the warmth of the store, now she is slide footing through a slick patch. She turns back sharply for something. And in the swift of fabric or something else, and she is gone. The cold air still had curled for a moment around her. A different girl, who lived, said that when she was abducted, this is the part where he had her in his Pontiac car. He had strong-armed her into it with a pistol from right off the street in front of the Nevada Tavern. She said he had lumpy skin on his face. And they were in the car, and he directed her somehow or the other not to overreact. And then he lurched onto her. The pistol and him over her back, he's behind her, and her shoulders are beginning to jostle, but then it's an actual sense of relief. That it's just speaker wire or something that's being wound tight around her wrists back there. They were starting to get out towards McHugh Creek, and it brings to mind that beauty is multidimensional. Inner beauty, outer beauty. And this girl was beautiful. You wouldn't believe how some of them act when she gives them a hint. That they could actually have a shot at nailing her. Some dork in horned rim glasses with acne scars and a fucking stutter. It's not quite a stutter, though. 
It's on an AIOU and it drags out his rising in pitch with his frustration while he's trying to fight it back. He disturbs the curtain from behind it and it's the only time you ever saw him. The real him in there, moving around. And it was only with your ears that you saw him. On December 22, 1971, Beth had planned to babysit and walked to a local grocery store for a soda while her brothers and cousin watched a movie at home. The Buy Low grocery store was within walking distance for Beth, and so was the apartment and parking lot where Susie was accosted. They are pulling into the secluded spot now, a large arcing parking lot surrounded by trees and these beautiful ocean mountainscapes all but lost and gone in the dark glass. Covering with steam from their breaths as she's playing it cool. The car is stopping and they have been talking about stuff and that she wants to, but not here in the parking lot. Someone could see us. And he looks at her. His paste complexion eerie in the dash glow. Reptilian eyes with a sticky tongue and his bride. And she saw him give in to it a little as he toned down the maniac bit and had her help him as he was pulling down her panties and her clothes, letting her lift up a little and shift her weight from one side to the other. It's so she promised not to run away. And he was respectful of her as he nodded his head in assurance and came close like to kiss her, soaking it in the beauty of her skin face. And her lips, his eyes come up to meet hers inches away. As it says in the tape, he fondled her. She said it was like they were on a date, then something happened. She felt him go dark inside, and it got real weird in the car, almost hard to breathe. He said he wanted to rip the bra off of her, and he looked at her again. Then you can put your clothes back on, and she let him do it. In the snatch of the fabric, her breasts splashing out in the open. And then he told her that she could go ahead and get dressed. And he drove far into the night, stopping at nearly every turn off, trying to convince her to let him have sex with her. But she didn't want to do it in the car. All the way to Cooper's Landing, 101 miles. And he rented a room at the Sunrise Inn, took her into the suite and tied her to the bed and raped her. She said that she called the police because the last two sunrises had been too surreal and frantic. But when she heard about the girl that they'd found, when it was her in the Pontiac car, she said he had hit her in the face one time. Then for her reaction, he watched like a lizard. He had called her different types of names and he would scan the landscape in her eyes. He was looking for something but then he'd resigned to drive on, pulling over later. He had told her he had killed women before, and that he was a respected businessman, and it hit home hard she had gulped a quivering knot in her throat, the tears almost overtaking her when he told her that she was just a whore and an addict, and no one cared about what happened to her, even if she did say something. Just days before Beth disappeared off the street, another young girl was scooped up in downtown Anchorage. She would survive with the abductor threatening to kill her and her son if she went to the authorities. But after hearing that another young girl had been taken, Barbara Fields knew she had to tell someone. In the hotel room, his thing was deformed, or not normal, it was too short and too fat around, she said eventually getting bored of all the different sets of the body motions she saw him frustrated and hindered 
his odd-shaped erection still defiant. When she felt the vacuum absence of him abruptly getting off of her. His coming to terms that he tried everything and he's not going to come. And she said to the detective that he never did. That first one of those three sunrises was surreal and eerie as they got into his car in the deep morning. Pulling out of the Sunrise Inn, the trip home to Anchorage an hour should be about. He turns the wheel and gasses the car the opposite direction of the momentum of her head. As the car comes out onto the road going the wrong way now, if he'd looked at that moment he would have seen it then. Her caving in inside. But he was spinning the wheel and letting it pull back as he came out quickly onto the road and they were gone. By the time he looked over, she was back online again and pretending she was okay. But she saw him staring through the world deep in thought. He couldn't quite put his finger on it. And he looked back at her, looking out the window. But she could see him in the glass, right in front of her face, behind her, he's driving. But his head is turned toward her. The glare from his glasses obscuring it. He's almost sure he can see her eyes in the reflection, staring back at him. She knew it already. He was going to take her out here and kill her, but there was something kindred between them. He had tried so hard, furrowing his brow, stern lips, and maybe she'd rubbed his shoulder, like his mother had when one of the other kids had broke his school project. It's okay, she said. Maybe it was just in the inflection of some farmland dialect. If she had to die, she could do it. But she didn't want to do it out here in the car. And she saw the vacuum absence of him abruptly when after forever he turned the car back towards Anchorage, his coming to terms that he's not going to kill her out here. And he takes out her ID and makes it real grand that he's got the address of her family and her child. The reptile grin under the landlord eyebrows. He says if she tells anyone that he will kill them. And when he dropped her off it had been 12 hours of this thing. And he told her genuinely that he wished they had met under different circumstances. He still didn't want to leave. The dreary, empty parking lot, one last thought it seems, but he drives off the tailpipe puffing exhaust in the cold. Out of the car now, she's standing upon the earth again. She almost collapsed, but wouldn't dare. She sloughed along like a zombie racehorse, inside banging, gaping shock. December 19, 1971, Barbara was taken at gunpoint, driven over many miles, and violated. She used her wits to convince the rapist that she would not turn him in, and she didn't, until the coincidences between her and Beth were too much to bear. Beth is in the Pontiac car now, heading out to the very close to town but secluded McHugh Creek. It's a large arcing parking lot surrounded by trees and these beautiful ocean mountainscapes all but lost and gone in the dark glass. Covering with steam from their breaths as he's tugging apart her belt and she's rocking back and forth violently and it's driving him crazy. He's frantic as he's yanking at her pants, she's attempting to fend him off for as long as she can, the shrill in her voice. Dragged out, rising in pitch and frustration, bursting all at once in a gasp of her breath, the shrill ending in desperate fragments of the word no. And he is clawing at her so quickly she can see herself moving and she's trying to kick. He was like the werewolf as he snatched her panties apart from off of her in a rip tear. The leverage was so cruel against her. 
pinning her down the angle of her joints, stealing any strength she had. The muscles cramping to fight off those horrible shapes the thighs make, and the hips becoming open to him, wriggling wildly like an animal. Bursting blood vessels in her eyes and upon her beautiful cheekbones. The fight burning everything inside, held captive now, in this frail body with gritting teeth. And he saw shock and surprise and saw it hurt her feelings with God. As the slippery old bar of soap crammed up into the neck of the coke bottle. Her eyes went up into the air and her mouth gasped open. And when her eyes came back down, the corners were drooping like to sob with. Her lips never touched yet. And he's scrambling for something on the floorboard. It is that knife and he yanks up her shirt. The wild, frantic girl in the heater fan blade is ticking as the warm air blowing comfort into the car. And his bare ass is in the reflection of the black glass, violently tightening and rigid. It was over as soon as it started. And opening his eyes into the world again, he must have got a glimpse of the Cretan's heaven. He looks around, shocked, and looks cheated out of. The voices are muffled from outside the car, words hidden from the ticking fan blade. His actions were very deliberate, though. It was in her eyes, his reflection was foolish and gangly. So it was terrifying when she realized the thud shake was the knife slapping on her and the door came open suddenly her head falling out and back he had her half up against the door with her legs up. She spills out as she's falling back the stars and the sky are so clear and so crisp. She hit the ground, puffed snow, scrambled to her feet. The werewolf seed was still slippery between her legs, the moonlight now a kin sister to her. And she bounded, breathing wild in the night. It felt as if she was flying by the time she made it into the shadow of the spruce boughs overhang. And she disappeared right before his eyes, in a curl of dust snow, and she was gone. The wind and the engine and the dome light casting out onto the thin snow of the parking lot. In an instant and so unexpectedly she was alive again. Beth would not be returning home from the store. No one picked her up and took her to babysit like her brothers initially thought. Instead, the day clicked a little closer to Christmas and their young sister was missing. The sun technically rose at 9.15 that morning. The long, flat angles of light allow one to watch the edge of the sunrise as it breaks for someone else. Eventually, our horizon crackles light upon a million frost crystals. The photographer's grunting, the twig pressing into his ribs, the cloth pulled up on his belly, and the air slipped across it. He stills his breath, the shuffle click of the shutter, but it was just a test shot. He won't know until later in the warm, dark room, but he knows. He had struggled to get this far from the parking lot, and he is imagining the angle of the sun cutting now at the edge of a mountain, fifty miles away. Where will it be in twenty seconds? He is Randy for the photo and is excited as he's repositioning when he says he sees a mannequin leg ten feet away, out of place out here in the snow. The detective is making his way in the cold. It appears that he is pushing through knee-deep water as he's crunching his own trail, looking very carefully, walking next to the photographer's footprints in the snow. Two sets, the ones going in, are the same as yours. The ones coming back out, though, you get to experience them, but in reverse. The somber footsteps coming out into the parking lot. They grow to a sprinting dash a few strides before a spin and turn and run in the trees. 
The detective stops and sees the shuffling footprints of the photographer who'd been trying to lean out a little farther for the camera in a sunbreak shot across the water in the mountains in sub-zero temperatures. The officers are having pictures taken of these weird tire tracks, a light dusting of snow last night, a car doing large circles in the parking lot for quite a long time, pressed down the light snow into ice tracks. The sun now melting the last of the feather crystals, the tire marks fading. As the photographers clicking the shutter, they crawl down through the brush, looking at the undisturbed snow on all of the trees. And there she is. A 50 foot drop, the heart would have been weightless and pounding when a new wave of adrenaline washed down upon it, finding a wasteland. The puzzle of land mass coming into view now. There was a little waterfall going up, appearing only at times like magic. You'd never know it had just been there except the ice found frozen down the wall, falling the water must have went, and there is the contact of this periodic splashings upon the stones and the trees, casting a splatter wash of teardrop ice smeared across them. It was too near where she landed. The arc of the sputtering ice on the ground makes a half circle, the center of it the water fell. The beautiful radius is touching another one, shaving an edge of a different half circle, the scratched up leaves. From under the snow, smearing tea shatter disturbed in all directions. A chaotic plowing of snow from the hard ice ground, little rocks frozen in, jutting out like glass shard. How cruel upon the scrambling flesh, not really felt in the cold, but just as a tugging numb. Upon leather skin, the slow tugboats are emerging from the fog, and they are heavy laden with something massive, and the fog horns are sounding like a great funeral procession for the whales. Periodically, as the ship tonnage of pain signals begin to make landfall, the delay and the tears lash instantly now across her skin and surprised now that the flicked back toenails are letting the soft plum beneath it to act as winter tread. Invisible are the tiny red brush strokes upon the ice in the circumference, gathering deeper in the center. Her legs and her waist are uncovered. The archangels should have had to creep in the dark to retrieve from the ice scratch each tear. The blatant evidence that she had been used of penned out in longhand the hissing accolade, victim. Bathed in awe, the brutal world, her chin stretched to the heavens at the headlights arcing through the trees up there, the tires rounding across the parking lot, sending sweeping lights in a flash across the trees, and the hum flick of the heater blower warming the floorboard and across the black windshield up there somewhere. Beth and Barbara were both bound, with their hands behind their back. The slicing of the bra, or wanting to, as well as fondling at McHugh Creek, both girls endured. They were both stripped to deter them from escaping, both sexually assaulted. In the garage of the rapist, an officer noticed a roll of speaker wire, similar to what was used on Beth, but did not take it as evidence. At the end of 1971, two more victims, Beth and Barbara, would be tied to this man. Wire wrapped, cutting into her skin, the blood flow decreasing, each shallow pump finding slowly into her blue fingers. The walls of the blood capillary swell inward, closing more and more. The large muscles shaking violently in a stutter shiver, burning fuel in bonfires of muscle quiver, the large thigh muscles flapping now. 
only to pump the hot blood to the brain and to the heart, a clanging fight down to the death. But in the empty cold fingers and by then her bare gentle toes, it is just a muffled commotion over there muted now. They are too far away from the campfire of life. The shadows obscuring now blue-black swollen darkness across their face. The bra, however, had been cleanly splashed open and is to the sides. The same blade must have been in such confusing fear she went off the rails when he slashed down, one across her chest outright, the other a little lower through the rib sheathing and the abdominal twist muscles and barely the membranes underneath. The cold air almost ashamed to have to reach in and touch the bristling edge of the razor's path that touched on the other side of the gut pack, making a trophy eyelash slit on some innard. At negative nine degrees below zero, the speaker wire is bound into her wrists behind her back. The shoulders are making like an angel. Thank you for listening to TC49. You can find us online on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Join our Patreon for extra content and visit our website for shirts, mugs, and stickers. See show notes for sources and links. In this episode, we use the name Barbara Fields to protect the survivor's identity.